You're listening to The Sports Stove with host Vince Stover. Here's what's cooking on today's Sports Stove podcast, part two, with host of the Bottom Line Lexington podcast, talking about the NFL draft. Enjoy today's Sports Stove podcast. Okay, we are back with the Bottom Line podcast host. All right, let's run through quickly here. I want to look through, um, we'll go each of the teams. We'll go by division, uh, looking through these teams and uh, anything that sticks out to you here in the draft coming up. Uh, so we'll start in the AFC East. We've got the Bills, the Jets, the Dolphins, and the Patriots. The Bills making some big moves here in the offseason, bringing in Stephon Diggs. They add Josh Norman, who hasn't been great here recently, but also some some quality depth on defense with EJ Gaines and Mario Addison. Same coaching staff's all back. They've got quality guys on the staff. Sean McDermott's been a good coach. Brian Dayball and Leslie Frazier, former head coach, uh, there as well. Uh, I love what the Bills are doing. Uh, last year was fun to watch, and they they know what they are, and they're playing what they are, and they seem to be, in my opinion, they're the best team in the East as is today. That could change with a, the right addition to another team, but uh, I love what the Bills are doing. The Jets... Uh, Adam Gase, do you trust that? Uh, Sam Darnold seems to be okay. They bring in Brashad Perriman at a great year last year at wide receiver, bring in some offensive line help as well. Uh, the Dolphins are the big talk of the draft, though, because they got 14 picks, the most picks uh, of all the teams in the NFL. They bring in a new offense coordinator and new defensive coordinator, which was very surprising to me after what I thought was a successful season last year. And then you've got the Patriots with the loss of Tom Brady. They really haven't done anything to a address it they bring in brian hoyer um and, and outside of that they bring in a good defensive help with adrian phillips the safety from the chargers um but out of those four teams uh what team do you think the draft can have the biggest impact on biggest impact honestly it's miami they've got more picks and they've they've got a lot of room to improve now the jets they're probably going to look at offensive line in the first round because they've already got their franchise quarterback. The Dolphins do not have their franchise quarterback. But I think you're looking at two playoff teams in this division, New England, Buffalo. Love Buffalo over eight and a half wins for the coming season. But I think New England is going to, like we talked about earlier, Belichick has got a lot to prove right now that he can win without Brady. New England, division champion. Buffalo, wild card. But you're looking at two playoff teams out of this division with the Dolphins looking to improve the most in this draft. On breaking news, bottom line says they're going to play at least nine games in the NFL season this upcoming season. There you go for all your coronavirus waiting people out there. There's no need for cheap shots now, Vince Stover. I'm just telling you what the desert's just, telling me. Just, okay? break, just breaking news. Uh, That's you right. don't have to be like that now. No need for that. All right, I like, uh, again, like I said, I like the Bills best in the division. I think the Jets uh, can make the biggest improvement because I think the right pick at number 11 can do a lot of things for this Jets team. They should have been better last year, but as we all know, uh, Mono wrecked the whole team. So go ahead. I'm raising my hand. Yeah. I'm raising my hand. Now, Mel Kuyper, our Lord and Savior of the NFL (laughs) draft, (laughs) what does Mel Mel Kuyper know anyway? Says that the Jets are going to take Jedrick Wills, from Lexington, from here in Lexington, as uh, their first round pick at offensive line, asked me, it, it brings to me, it makes me think of a question. Do you think he was wrong, Jedrick Wills, to go to Alabama instead of going to Kentucky? Oh, no. Alabama is going to bolster. Just being on a team, like you said earlier, is going to make you a higher draft pick uh-huh. than Alabama. So, so you, no. didn't, you didn't fault him like when Damian Harris, who is from uh, Madison County, back where I'm at, you thought when he went to Alabama, you didn't fault him for going there instead of going to Kentucky. He could have gotten 200 plus. He could have been the next Benny Snell at Kentucky, but then he goes to Alabama and gets a couple of championship rings. Yeah, I mean, it depends on how you grow up. Some kids want to be on the best teams in the nation, other kids want to be on their local teams. Right. And that always varies person to person. Um, a lot of you, people here thought they were crazy for doing that. I thought they were, I thought it was a great decision. Yeah. But a lot of people here <laughs> disagreed with that. A lot of the people in, in Lexington, Kentucky, um, they're so tied to the cats. They, they too, though, would take the opportunity of given to go play for the best team and maybe the best coach of, of all of college football history. You get that opportunity. It's really hard to say no to. And I mean, more than likely, some of those kids, their their teammates were being offered by Kentucky. Um, and, and between Kentucky and Western Kentucky were their options, whereas these guys had the opportunity to go to Alabama. Now, I don't fault any kid for going to one of the top top uh, programs in the nation at all. 
Uh, I don't think the Jets are taking. I'm going to disagree with Mel Kuyper, by the way. Uh, yeah, they brought in three free agent offensive linemen uh, that are going to start for them this year, left tackle and two uh, a center and a guard. Uh, I don't see them going offensive line. I think they have greater needs right now, uh, wide receiver, edge rusher, um, even some defensive back needs. Uh, so I don't see them going there. They might, but I think they are looking for more of a splash uh, this year uh, in their draft picks. So AFC East is an interesting division this year. With Tom Brady leaving, it, it opens it up. And last year, the Bills Bills showed up in a big way. The Jets underachieved drastically, and Miami was Miami. So we'll see how well they improve this year. On the AFC North, uh, which we are here in Lexington, Kentucky, and everybody in, Kentucky, in Lexington seems to be either Cincinnati or Pittsburgh fans. And uh, and so we've got both of them here in this division, along with Baltimore, uh, who, who played great ball last year, Cincinnati, Cleveland, who was a massive disappointment last season, and then Pittsburgh. The Really, the big change this year is the Browns and their coaching staff bringing in a new head coach, Kevin Stefanski, uh, and then offensive coordinator Alex Van Pelt. And and uh, he's worked with some really good quarterbacks uh, here recently, especially Joe Woods, the defense coordinator. They've got a lot of needs in Cleveland, or actually I should say that differently. They don't have a lot of needs in Cleveland. They bring in some quality veteran help with uh, Jack Conklin on the offensive line, Austin Hooper, the tight end. And uh, so they seem to have improved upon their talent is is really good in Cleveland. It's can you put the talent together and play. So let's ask this question again. Um, well, let me go with this because you wrote an article recently, uh, a blog recently about Cincinnati and uh, how well they have wasted their draft picks over the years. Uh, let's get some thoughts on Cincinnati Bengals. Cincinnati Bengals, a lot of room to improve, and I will tell you this right now. Without the coronavirus, they're supposed to win five and a half games this year. I'm going to say over. And you make a good point. I've never been to a place where the closest NFL team is not the favorite NFL team of most of the people. I know more Pittsburgh Steelers fans here than I do Cincinnati Bengals fans. I know more Dallas Cowboy fans. I know more Green Bay Packers fans than I do Bengals fans. But, yes, they're going to win more than five and a half games this year if there is a full season because they've signed a lot of people. They've got good draft picks coming in. You got a second year coach. Hopefully, he'll be better than the disaster he was in year one. But there's a lot of room for improvement. And the Bengals, in spite of themselves, might just get to six or seven games this year. We'll see what happens. But you've got two playoff teams in this division you've got Baltimore, you've got Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh's the one team we don't know what to expect. I right. saw a picture of Ben Roethlisberger last week. He looked <laughs> 350 pounds. I thought he was about to try out for professional wrestling. Yeah. Apparently not. But, yeah, Baltimore's the team. I would take 11 and a half wins for Baltimore. I'm going to go under. I don't think they're going to have the monster miracle season they had with Lamar Jackson last year. But I'll take Baltimore and Pittsburgh to make the playoffs in this one. I'll also take under eight and a half wins for Cleveland. I'm sorry if you expect them just to circle the wagons immediately and now get over nine, get nine or more wins, even if they do have a quarterback. Who's the coach? We don't know. Kevin Stefanski, is he as good as the co- the coach they had last year? Can't be any worse. So there you go. Cleveland under eight and a half wins, even though they've got talent. We How long have we heard that now for three years? Yeah. So there you go. It's easy. It's a easy call. Two playoff teams in this division, Baltimore-Pittsburgh. One team, Cincinnati on the rise, hopefully for them. One team still mired in mud, Cleveland Browns under eight and a half wins. I have a theory that recently has proven correct. Um, we'll see over the long term, but new coach, especially if it's an offensive minded new coach, they're going to have a great first season. Then they'll fall off after that. Chicago did this a couple years ago uh, when they brought in Matt Nagy. They had a great first season, 12, 13 wins, whatever it was. Then last year they were nothing again. So I think Cleveland is actually going to be a team to watch as they're going to take a push this year, having an offensive minded head coach that came in new system. It's going to take a little bit of time for people to, to catch up to it. Uh, uh, that are defenses to catch up to it. So I think Cleveland will make a rise. How big? I have no idea. Uh, they've got so much drama on that team. It's hard to say what's going to happen with them. Uh, but I think they'll make a little bit of a rise. You're right. The Bengals improved. They've they've improved their defense vastly here in the offseason, bringing in DJ Reader on the defensive line, Vaughn Bell and Trey Waynes on the defensive backs. They didn't really lose too much. Tyler Eifert, but he hasn't really contributed for them in a while. Andrew Billings on the defensive line, but they replaced him with Reader. So I think they have improved. The question is going to be purely quarterback for them. How much will Joe Burrow come in and affect their win-loss uh, categories 
there as well. Baltimore, who was great last year, they lost one person in Michael Pierce defensive tackle. They lost more people, but that's the one that matters. And they've replaced him with Calais Campbell. They've also brought in Derek Wolf recently uh, as well. And so I think the Ravens are the safest, uh, the safest consistent bet to go with. Steelers, my goodness. I, to me, it just feels like every year it's getting closer and closer to falling off the cliff. Um, ben Roethlisberger last year got hurt, so how healthy will he be this year? You're right. He looks uh, <laughs> old. He looks uh, Large. a little heavy. Um, <laughs> looks like he's, he's been sitting on the couch for six months. Yeah, looks like. yeah, he's been enjoying the quarantine, it looks like. But but if they came close to the playoffs last year, yeah. if they, they, were the, they were the 17 last year. They would have been right. in the playoffs. If they did that last year without Ben, just think what a – decent Ben Roethlisberger would do for them now yeah yeah I yeah I just don't trust the Steelers <laughs> at all but that's the AFC North AFC South is a, a division that's getting worse and worse by the day uh, Texans Colts Jaguars and Titans uh, on here what in the world's happening in Houston Bill O'Brien oh my goodness uh, he's trading away his best player for a second round pick and an injured running back that hasn't performed well in two years and David Johnson and maybe David Johnson's healthy and maybe he's going to be what he used to be in Houston but Bill O'Brien is seems to be just completely wrecking this Houston team and a team that that has so much talent and when you look at what they did last year I love Deshaun Watson uh, DeAndre Hopkins has been on my fantasy football team and I absolutely love him with Deshaun Watkins uh, with Deshaun Watson and I'm scared to death of, of how he's going to perform with Kyler now but nonetheless less Houston's getting worse Jacksonville doesn't have a quarterback Indianapolis is as Philip Rivers so I'm not sure if that's good or bad and then the Titans are are happy to stick with Ryan Tannehill what do you see going on here in the AFC South easily the most difficult division to project in terms of who's going to make the playoffs who's going to win it what is Philip Rivers going to look like with Indy do we know right. we don't know that at all right. the fact that they went out and got him it says so many different things. Are they giving up on Jacoby Brissett? Um, what is Tennessee doing? Are they really satisfied with Tannehill? They let Mariota go, but well, they probably should. Mm-hmm. What, Deshaun Watson and who in Texas? <laughs> is, who wins this division? I think the value is still with Tennessee. Our friends out in the desert say Indy, Tennessee, and Texas, and the Texans will all win eight and a half games this year. I'm going to go with Tennessee getting a little value. But we don't even know. You mentioned Jacksonville. They can only go up, but how can they go up with a quarterback situation like they do? I look at all these uh, free agent quarterbacks. Dalton and Winston are favored to be the quarterback with Jacksonville next year. They're both up there. They're favored to be their next team's quarterback. Who knows who's going to be the quarterback for Jacksonville next year? They just got rid of Nick Foles. Yeah, your guess is as good as mine. I'll lean Tennessee, but I'll say Tennessee and Indy both make the playoffs from this division. Texas just, the Texas just miss out, but your guess is as good as mine on how the top three in this one will end up. Tennessee lost two important offensive pieces in Conklin on the offensive line. Deion Lewis, the backup running back, was an important part of their offense. Uh, they do bring in Vic Beasley, which I think is a great move for them. He'll add, add well uh, to their defense. The question uh, in Tennessee is, can they run the ball as effectively as they did last year? And they still don't have really great receivers. They, they, they need to improve that drastically. Indianapolis is an interesting team this year. They bring in some good defensive help into DeForest Buckner and Xavier Rhodes. They gave up that 13th pick for DeForest Buckner, and I'm not sure that I would have done that um, because of how talented uh, the draft is, especially at wide receiver this year. 13 is a great spot uh, to, to grab somebody. Phillip Rivers, I think he'll be better this year than he has been the last couple years uh, with the Chargers. I think that the offensive line's better. I think the situation is better. He does have uh, already connection with the coach, Coach Wright, and and so ideally there's going to be a flawless transition as far as system and things like that go. I think Indianapolis is the perfect fit for Jameis Winston to come in and sit behind Phillip Rivers for one year and take over. After that, I don't think it's going to happen. I think they would have brought him in to start if that's what they wanted to do. The rumor is Tom Brady wanted to go to Indianapolis, and they said, no, we're going to go with Phillip Rivers. Now, if that's true – they're crazy. But nonetheless, uh, I like Indianapolis. I like the general talent on their team. Um, but I think Jacksonville's the team to watch for. It depends on what they do at quarterback. As it sits right now, I don't trust Jacksonville. They bring in a quarterback, though. Uh, going back to my theory, you bring in a new offensive-minded coach. They still have the same head coach, Doug Marone. They bring in Jay Gruden, who was a 
bad head coach. Um, but they bring in Jay Gruden. Can he do something with the offense? Who knows? They didn't really add anybody great this year um, either. They've done very little here in the offseason. Uh, I have no idea. I like Indianapolis. I'll go with them. I don't trust Tennessee. Uh, but they had, were successful last year with Tannehill. So if they can maintain that, obviously they've got a good shot to win uh, the AFC South, which right now is, is a, a little bit of a laughing stock in the NFL. On to the AFC West, we got uh, Denver, Kansas City, the Los Angeles Chargers, and the Las Vegas Raiders. That's got a good good ring to it. Uh, the Las Vegas Raiders as well. All right, so let's talk about these four teams. You've got the Super Bowl champs in Kansas City uh, with no money to spend, and then you've got a uh, young quarterback in Denver, no quarterback in the Chargers, and two quarterbacks that nobody likes in Las Vegas. What do you think about these teams? San Diego, who's their quarterback? San Diego doesn't have a football team. I'm sorry. The Chargers. I still say San Diego all the time. Uh, the Chargers. Vince Stover is still a jerk as always, ladies and gentlemen. I uh, thought I'd add that in. Tyrod Taylor. Tyrod Taylor, yeah. Do you think he's going to really start week, week one? Do you think that? Man, they are trying very hard to make everybody believe that he's going to. Um, i I got to believe they're going to go up in the draft and, and get, get the quarterback that they want. Well, there's six in the draft right now. And I, if they will have a chance to draft Herbert, yep. if they want Herbert, they'll get him. Yep. If they don't, it's Cam Newton because our friends out in the desert say it's even money that Cam Newton will be co- quarterbacking the San Diego Chargers next year. Now, do you believe that? Eh, I don't know, but when Las Vegas tells you something and the odds are that even, it's pretty much you know that's a good there's a good chance of that happening. So Cam Newton with the Chargers, yeah, it's a much, it's a much more different perspective you have on the Chargers, but. The worst home field advantage in all of football. They're moving into a new stadium. They're, even if, if no virus or virus, they're still going to have less than 20,000 people in a stadium, and more people will be there for the other team. So, And they're sitting at eight in Las Vegas for over-under wins. I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. I think you're looking at one playoff team in this division. That's KC. And Oakland, now Las Vegas Raiders, with David Carr still. Did I say which car is it? Derek Carr, excuse me. Derek Carr is still the quarterback. John Gruden still hates him. They brought in another Heisman Trophy winner, which the Raiders always do. It's all about the Heisman. Mariota is now the quarterback. He'll be starting before the end of the season. I can promise you that. Seven and a half for the Raiders. Under. We'll take under on that one. But, yes, Oakland and San Diego has the most room for improvement depending on how they use that draft pick if they take Justin Herbert or not. And when he says Oakland and San Diego, he means Las Vegas and L.A. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm old. I literally wrote, are, I wrote, on my paper right here, I wrote S.D. and O.A.K. I, it's so hard to get it. past it. It's it so really is. Yes. The uh, If you go back and listen to my previous podcast, I've been I've been shouting Cam Newton to the Chargers for, for a couple months now. To me, it's the perfect fit. Uh, and, uh, Lynn, the coach at, at the Chargers, has said he wants to be mobile at quarterback. Uh, Tyrod Taylor is mobile, sure. Cam Newton, if he is 75% of what he can be, he is the best option to play this year for the Chargers. He will sell some tickets. He's he's weird. Uh, he's got crazy fashion. Uh, but he will sell some tickets and bring in some people for the Chargers. He's a great fit for them. Whether it be you sign him on a one-year contract, give him a chance to prove he's still got it. If he's still got it, then you sign him at the end of the season to a longer contract. If he doesn't, you go on to the quarterback that you draft this year. Tyrod Taylor is not going to give you success with the Chargers. He didn't give success in Buffalo. He's not going to give success at the Chargers. It doesn't make any sense for him to go with Tyrod Taylor into the season. They're, they're talking about doing what you know, kind of what was done here recently. A lot of people are doing. You start your veteran guy for two, three, four weeks, and then you bring in the rookie like they did with New York and Eli and Daniel Jones. But it, it just doesn't make any sense. You've got a talented team. Uh, you need a talented quarterback to run the team. You want to know how much times have changed? <laughs> Steve McNair was drafted in the mid '90s by the Oilers. Yeah. Chris Chandler was quarterbacking the Oilers then before he went to Atlanta. He started for two years before Steve McNair ever saw the field for the Oilers. Two years. If you do that, if you and McNair was a third overall pick the year he came out. If you did that today, oh man, they would the social media world would kill any coach or anybody, any well, team, and they everybody would everybody would assume that that quarterback that was drafted number three is no good. Right. If they can't win a job and he was drafted number three and can't beat out the veteran. You know, it's there was a difference when you're talking about Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers because Brett Favre is a Hall of Fame quarterback, um, but he, and no one and Aaron Rodgers was drafted in the 20s. 
uh, where as opposed if you draft a guy number one, number two, number three, Indianapolis got rid of, let Peyton Manning leave because they're bringing a number one draft pick. You would think that's the perfect guy to sit behind. Even they understood if you're going to take quarterback high, he plays, and that's just the end of the story. Well, Brett Favre was his second round draft pick, How did, right? And then the Packers gave Atlanta a first round draft pick for him. Ron uh, Wolf. I've, oh, Ron Wolf just takes Ken Ken Herrock to the cleaners. <laughs> they both worked together with the Raiders, by the way. Yeah. So Ron Wolf knew that Ken Herrock was an imbecile when it came to stuff like that. That's why he's like, I'll give you a one. Ken Herrock literally had to put him on hold so he could stop laughing. <laughs> and then Ron Wolf is now a Hall of Famer, and Ken Herrock is you know, we're rubbing. I've never even heard of him. Ken Herrock, <laughs> Ken Herrock is now in a car wash somewhere in uh, Buford, Georgia. Yes. Not that there's anything wrong with car wash employees. Um, so the <laughs> NFC West. Well, if you were a former NFL general manager, maybe there is, but that's. I'm just either. trying to be nice. Uh, the the AFC West. Uh, the Broncos, to me, are interesting because of the quarterback situation. They bring in some good talent. Melvin Gordon's a great addition uh, to the team. They bring in Pat Shermer as their offensive coordinator. Not sure how much that's going to help. Um, but Drew Locke, is he the answer in Denver? Uh, if I was a Denver fan, I don't know if I'd be super excited about that. Kansas City is going to be great again this year. Uh, Las Vegas, who knows what they're doing. Uh, John Gruden seems to really dislike Derek Carr. And Derek Carr has shown in the past that he has ability. Uh, so the question is, is why does Gruden hate him so much? The talk is, is Mariota going to do exactly what Tannehill did to him last year? And within the first six or seven weeks, uh, Mariota is going to be starting in Las Vegas. Is, is Mariota better than Derek Carr? Maybe. Um, are they going to run a system that fits Mariota? Because Tennessee didn't. Um, I don't know what's going on in Vegas. And right now, I have no reason to trust uh, Gruden and what he's doing uh, there. I love what the Chargers have done the offseason, minus getting a good quarterback. Uh, they bring in offensive line help with Trey Turner and Brian Balaga, uh, Chris Harris at cornerback, Linval Joseph at defensive line. Um, they lost a couple pieces too, but I think if they can get the quarterback right, whether it be in the draft or free agency, they're going to be a very dangerous team in the AFC. And uh, really, though, no one's going to compete with Kansas City in that division. All right, let's move over to the NFC and keep it moving here. The NFC East, Dallas, New York Giants, Philadelphia Eagles, and the Washington Redskins. Three new head coaches in this division. Uh, Dallas brings in uh, the experienced Super Bowl winning head coach Mike McCarthy. Uh, Giants bring in a guy that no one knew until he got hired, Joe Judge. And then the Redskins bring in veteran coach Ron Rivera as well. Uh, What do you think about the NFC East heading into the 2020 season? Just like last year, you've got two halves and two have-nots. You've got Dallas (laughs) and Philly on top. You've got the Giants and Washington on the bottom. Washington does not have their franchise quarterback because why is there all this talk about Tua going to Washington? The Giants do have their franchise quarterback. Thank God Eli Manning's gone. That's another story for another day. <laughs> but, yeah, it's it's the haves and have-nots in this one. Washington, if they could use these draft picks they have well, might be on to something because I don't see Dwayne Haskins starting 10 games this year for them. I see either a rookie or Kyle Allen starting by midseason. But it's Dallas and Philly, Dak Prescott versus Carson Wentz. Not exactly the Titans that you would think that uh, these two teams would have a quarterback. But yeah, it's Dallas, the team with the most room to improve, Washington. If you ask me who's going to go over and under, I think the Giants, excuse me, I think the Eagles over nine might be your pick this year, especially if you get anything from Carson Wentz, who's seemingly done nothing but underachieve ever since he came back from his ACL surgery three years ago. I think it's, the draft is going to play a big role on how this uh, season turns out in the NFC East because when you're looking at just the free agent moves and the signings and the losses for each of these teams, no team has really done a, a whole lot as far as adding great talent. Philadelphia lost an important piece on defense in Malcolm Jenkins. They bring in a couple of defensive veterans, but no one that's going to fill the role that Malcolm Jenkins had uh, there. Dallas, they haven't done a whole lot either. They lost Byron Jones, but that was on purpose because uh, they weren't going to pay him over the other guys that they have to pay then they also lost robert quinn who should be a great piece in chicago uh they bring in gerald mccoy they bring in a good kicker uh from the rams greg zerline as well um coaching is going to play an interesting role usually in the nfl i don't give the coach a whole lot of credit necessarily but the coaching is going to play an interesting role in this division this year mccarthy obviously faded out in green bay didn't seem to have a great relationship with the quarterback there uh, at the end at the very least he brings in mike nolan as defensive coordinator has a ton of experience in the nfl 
NFL. Mike McCarthy was an offensive assistant under Nolan when he was head coach in San Francisco, so that's intriguing. Kellen Moore sticks around. Why? Because Jerry Jones wants him to. That's always scary when the owner plays a big role in who your staff is going to be. Uh, the Giants probably brought in some of the most intriguing pieces. Um in the offseason, Blake Martinez, who was a tackling machine in Green Bay. James Bradbury, the defensive back. And Deion Lewis is a great addition at running back as well to give that extra, uh, uh, the one-two punch with Saquon Barkley. But we don't know anything about Joe Judge. Can he coach? Well, he worked with Saban and he worked with Belichick. Well, who, who cares? Um, uh, Jason Garrett's the offensive coordinator. Does that get you excited? Uh, it doesn't me. Uh, and then Patrick Graham, defense coordinator, who's been coming through the ranks uh, both in New England and Green Bay. Uh, so there's a lot of question marks there. We don't expect them to be Super Bowl team this year with Daniel Jones. Uh, but I think New York's going to improve. And then the Redskins, they bring in good veteran coaching as well with Ron Rivera, Jack Del Rio, the defensive coordinator. Can they level out the craziness in Washington? And again, quarterback, like you said, is it's a big question mark in Washington. So I'm with you, Philly and, and Dallas there in the East. I think this is Dallas's chance. Uh, to come in this year and, and make a big splash. I don't know if they'll keep it up after this year, but uh, I think Dallas wins the division this year and Philly makes it into the playoffs. Yes or no? Will McCarthy get to a Super Bowl with Dallas? I hate Dallas. I sure hope not. Uh, <laughs> I, I, it wasn't it, that. It was it's, yes or no, if it's still over. If Will they're, they're going to do it, they're going to have to do it in the next two seasons. And I think that's going to be really hard to do. There's so much talent in the NFC right now and in the NFL with, with what's going on in Kansas City and Baltimore, too. Um, so I'm going to say no. I would agree with that. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I think he's a good coach. I, I, it's nothing against Mike McCarthy himself. Oh, he's not a good um, coach. How many playoff games did he just blow for the Packers? A lot. Uh-huh. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> one is too many. Yeah, but I was, he has more than one. As a Packer fan, I was ready for him to go. But again, I think I think if you you use this my philosophy of new offensive minded coach, he's going to have potential in his first season to to really do uh, take this the league by storm, so to say. He's got the talent and Dak Prescott if he signs his tender or if he signs his long term deal. And Ezekiel Elliott, he's got Amari Cooper. They've got some some still some talent on the offensive line, even though they lost uh, their center to retire retirement at age 29 uh they still have some talent on the offensive line to me this is the season for them to do it if they're going to do it um after that they i think they've still got another season but before long uh elliott's going to be beat up he's going to be having a hard time running cooper's good i like michael gallup too the other receiver over there in dallas um but time is short for them right now their defense is going to have to improve drastically as well so so i think it's an interesting division as well uh, uh, and everything that's going on, a couple of young quarterbacks, a couple of veteran guys, uh, and, and an interesting new, all kinds of new coaches there. Uh, NFC North, uh, this is the, the division I study the most being the Packer fan, but we got Chicago, Detroit, Green Bay, and the Vikings. I think it's a two team division. What do you think? Bears have a chance to make it a three team division. Now, do they get the quarterback play? Do they bench Trubisky early enough to where Foles is able to do something in that division? Who knows? But I think Foles is your your week one quarterback for them. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, they announced this past week that it's an open competition. And as soon as you say uh-huh. that, <laughs> uh-huh. then it's over for the guy who was there before. It's over for now, the incumbent. Yeah. I've heard other people say that, that they've oh, yes, they've opened the competition, but they still want Trubisky to win it because he's the guy they traded up to draft, and he was in the same draft as, as Mahomes and Watson and all that kind of stuff. If you're smart, you got to cut it when when it's time to cut it. When it's you know it's not going to work, then get rid of it and be done with it. Admit that you were wrong and move on. Uh, but as a Packer fan, I'm not scared of either of those guys, and I really don't care who wins who wins the quarterback job because I don't think that they're good enough to take the next step forward in Chicago. You believe in the Packers, coach? I, I the question isn't the coach. It's do I believe in the relationship between the coach and the quarterback? And at this point, I'm not sold yet. I think Rodgers has done more to push against uh, the coach than he has to accept the coach. What I watch Packer games right now, what I see is Rodgers holding the ball when he should have thrown it three seconds earlier. And he's waiting for that big play. But when Rodgers has been his best is when he hits those slants and those short uh, short patterns and then the occasional bomb down the field. And right now, Rodgers is not playing within the system. He's playing within himself. And that's what does the, the biggest problem. So can LaFleur get Rodgers to play within the system is the question. I'm a little skeptical of that right now. What Detroit does with the third pick will determine a lot in this division for the next few seasons. Uh, 
Vegas has them at six and a half wins. I don't see them reaching six and a half, but that's just me. Minnesota is probably the the one team in this division where they could win eleven, and I wouldn't be shocked. They could win six, I wouldn't be shocked. They're, <laughs> they're, they're, that's the one team that's very difficult, especially with our quarterback situation. It's very difficult to predict. I have no faith in Chicago, Foles, or Trubisky. So it's Green Bay, and that's my only playoff team out of this one. But Minnesota at eight and a half, I would love to go over on them. But I just can't pull the trigger because of Kirk Cousins. Yeah, it's it's really weird. I think both Green Bay and the Vikings could be eleven wins or six wins. Right. Uh, Chicago could be nine wins or three wins. Detroit could be one win or two wins, uh, or or maybe five or six wins as well. Um, Minnesota, I don't trust Kirk Cousins. To me, he, again, just being as a, a, a cheering for a team that goes against Minnesota, Kirk Cousins doesn't scare me. Losing Stephon Diggs, even though they didn't use him right last season, they've lost some important defensive players. Trey Wayne. Xavier Rhodes, both in the defensive backfield. Uh, Linval Joseph was, has been a really good piece for them. They lost him. They, they really didn't replace those guys, so their draft is going to be important as well. Green Bay, same thing. They didn't really add anybody, uh, any kind of splash in free agency. Uh, they spent a lot of money last year in free agency, so they clearly couldn't this year. They lose Blake Martinez, um, which, again, he was an important piece of that defense uh, there, but they feel like he wasn't a scheme fit. Um, losing Belog on the offensive line, they replaced him with a guy who got cut by Detroit. That's scary. Uh, as well. Chicago has made the best additions, being in Robert Quinn and Barkevius Mingo on defense, Artie Burns as well. So their defense is continuing to get better, and they've got a really good defense as it is. But their offense still is just, they're going to have to do something. They bring in a new offensive coordinator, and Bill, was, uh, uh, what's his name, Lazor. Uh, I think he was with Cincinnati before. And uh, so, again, you know, it'll be interesting to see the difference they make. Um, as a Green Bay Packer fan, the biggest hope that I have is that the rest of the division just isn't great. <laughs> that, gives, that gives the most hope. If things click between LaFleur and Rodgers, then, my goodness, they could be a 13-win team. But uh, who knows how that'll, how that'll turn out in the end. Quarterback is always the biggest fun to talk about, and and Chicago is just a mess right now. Um, I don't remember who said it, but if you have two quarterbacks, you have zero quarterbacks. Um, Nick Foles, I like him as a person. I think he's a good person. Uh, Trubisky, I'm sure he's a great well, no, dude. No, they only have one quarterback. It's Foles. Yeah. Trubisky is not an NFL quarterback. Although the, the Bears are only – the only reason Trubisky is still on the Bears is because they're trying to save face because they wasted the second overall pick on him a few years back. Yeah. yeah. So if, if that wasn't the case, if he was just a third-rounder that they you know picked up, you know, oh, by the way, yeah, he would have already been gone. But there was – here's a fact for you. No player – got more money on the MVP last year out in Las Vegas <laughs> than Mitch Trubisky yeah. did. He was, I think it was 21 to 20 to 1 before the season start. So many people thought this is the guy, this is the year. So many people were wrong and Las Vegas was still to this day they're still laughing at the bank on that one. And you can go back to the Bottom Line Lexington podcast when I came on and we talked football preview and I said from the beginning the Bears were an under team and they were going to flop in that that season. Uh again it's just that Matt Nagy had his good first year but you knew things were going to work out. Plus, they lost Vic Fangio um, uh, as defensive coordinator. That made a big difference. Too. The yep. defense was still good, but they weren't as great as they were under Fangio. And, uh, and now, yeah, Nick Foles and, and Trubisky, you know, if you're a Chicago Bears fan, I know I've got one listener at least that is. I'm sorry. Uh, truly, truly sorry for you. <laughs> right. Walter Payton ain't walking through that door. <laughs> Jim McMahon ain't walking through that door. Mike Ditka ain't walking through that door. <laughs> Oh, boy. Uh, All right, let's move on. Uh, NFC South, you've got Atlanta, Carolina, New Orleans, and Tampa. Tampa made the biggest splash in the offseason with Tom Brady. Carolina made the biggest changes in the offseason with coaching staff and quarterbacks. What do you think about this NFC South division? Even before Tampa signed Tom Brady, they scored 458 points last year. They outscored their opponents. Now they had a losing record. They were seven and nine, but they still showed that they could put up some numbers. Even though Jameis Winston was a thirty thirty man, and the nine games they lost, six of them by were by a touchdown or less. Yep. And their turnover margin, especially with Winston, <laughs> they were minus thirteen. Yeah. Any NFL team who has had a turnover margin of minus thirteen or more the following year, it's been thirty one occasions, thirty three occasions. 22 of those 33 have improved on their record the following year. Four of those 33 have stayed even. Seven, they've gotten worse. So 67% of the time, when you have a turnover margin of minus 13 or more in the NFL, the next season, 67% of the time, you're better. 
That's before you bring in Tom Brady over Jameis Winston. So, yeah, Tampa is a playoff team this year. Vegas has them at 8.5 right now. That's an over for me. The Saints are an over for me. They're 10.5. They're, that's a t- team you're looking at to go under. But still, Tampa, New Orleans, those are your two playoff teams. Best under bet on the board for my money. Atlanta, 7.5. They have been... They have been dead. They've been flatlining ever since the 28 to three Super Bowl when they lost that game. Dan Quinn should have been gone two years ago. He's still there. They're a disaster. Seven and a half, easy under in that one. And Carolina, I like them over. Although Teddy Bridgewater, does he? Is he the? He's a winner. Yeah, Teddy Bridgewater. They'll be over five and a half this year with McCaffrey. But yeah, this is an easy one. Saints and Tampa in your playoffs with Carolina. Room to improve, and Atlanta just basically playing out the season until they could fire Dan Quinn. You told me last season, before the season started, Dan Quinn's last season in Atlanta would be the 2018-19 season. He obviously survived. Many people were surprised by this. But let me ask you this. They bring in Dante Fowler, who's a great defensive rush edge. They bring in Todd Gurley, who's a question mark because of health. Big question mark. And then they bring in – they lose Austin Hooper, but they bring in Hayden Hurst, who's a really good tight end from Baltimore as well. The question is, and what I questioned was – is how many losses will it take for Dan Quinn to lose the locker room? Because last year, the locker room, that's what saved his job, is the locker room said, we want him here. We It's our fault that we lost. Don't blame it on him. Keep him around, and we'll get better. Well, I mean, if they start off the season 1-4, and four, uh, I mean, what's it going to take? If they end the season like they started, or like they, if they start the season like they ended last season, they'll be just fine. But they, they cut their starting running back from last year in Devontae Freeman. They bring in Todd Gurley, who we're assuming is not healthy. Um, can he carry the ball, you know, I don't know, 15 to 20 times a game maybe? Um, but he's not going to be that, uh, uh, that bell cow that can just run it 30 times a game. You would assume not at least, or else L.A. would have kept him. Um, so, so what hope does Atlanta have this year? Do they have any? They've got great receivers. Um, and, and I think Matt Ryan's good. Is he great? Not necessarily, but I'd put him in that same category as maybe Phillip Rivers um, uh, when you're looking at, at, at stats and career-wise. Um, is there any hope in Atlanta? Take out the year that uh, Kyle Shanahan was in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And you tell you, that's Matt Ryan's MVP season when Shanahan, right. was, Shanahan was there. He, he's like, it's just like you said. He's good, but he's not great. And you know he can win games for you. But he's not going to win twelve games for you. Hmm. So, and you're looking at Matt Ryan. He was drafted in 2008. Yeah. So he's been there for a while now, a long time. Yeah. Is he a Hall of Famer? Eh, it would have helped if he had won that Super Bowl. But I don't know if he's a Hall of Famer. And he's been starting for 12, 13 years now. It's over for Atlanta. This this whole thing. And Arthur Blank. He is a good man now. And I know my time in Atlanta, I know Arthur Blank. He is trying his hardest not to fire Dan Quinn. He does not <laughs> want to fire Dan Quinn. And he will not fire Dan Quinn midseason. I can promise you that. Bobby Petrino was 3-12 and before, I think 2-11 and or something like that. Had three games to go. And he wasn't going to fire Petrino either. But, yes, Arthur Blank's not going to fire anybody midseason. Unless, you know, it's an 0-8 and they have a bye week. They might fire him then. But yeah, it's over for Dan Quinn Atlanta. The fact that, like you said, the fact they brought him back was a disaster in itself. Todd Gurley has nothing left. It's obvious. This team is going nowhere, especially offensively, even with the great receivers and the borderline Hall of Fame quarterback. It's over for the Falcons, and I hate to say it because I'm basically from Atlanta. But, yeah, it's a goodbye, Atlanta. Seven and a half, best bet on the board for me, under seven and a half total wins. Carolina is a team I really like coming into this season. I don't, I don't necessarily think they're going to be a playoff team. Matt Rule's an interesting hire. Uh, out of the college ranks. They bring in Joe Brady, the offensive coordinator, had a great season at LSU, obviously worked for New Orleans Saints before that. Um, They bring in Phil Snow as defense coordinator, Matt Matt Rule's man. Uh, You know, how's that going to work out? I don't know. They bring in Teddy Bridgewater, but along with Teddy Bridgewater, they also bring in P.J. Walker. The one guy that I tuned in for to watch in the XFL was P.J. Walker. Nobody else there. I wasn't super excited about P.J. Walker, but nonetheless, if I was going to watch the XFL, P.J. Walker was the guy that I was watching. And I, um, I said on my podcast previously that, that he was the one guaranteed XFL player to get a job in the NFL. I've heard 
and, and you know, it's my sources uh, from other professionals talking. I've heard that PJ Walker and Teddy Bridgewater are competing for the starting job. It's not just going to be Teddy Bridgewater's job. And the way that PJ Walker played in the XFL, and the talent is different, but the way that PJ Walker played in the XFL, he brings more excitement to the fan base than does Teddy Bridgewater. It's going to be an interesting competition between them. I think Teddy Bridgewater wins that job, uh, but it'll be intriguing to see. You know, I was never a Teddy Bridgewater fan. He went to Louisville. He he then was in Minnesota, two places that I'm not fans of. Uh, but I really like what he did in New Orleans last season. Uh, how much money is Teddy Bridgewater getting paid? More than P.J. Walker. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> He's not getting paid a ton, I though. rest my yeah. case, Your Honor. Yeah. That's it's, all I needed to know. Thank you. But I go back to this, too. In Seattle, Matt Flynn got paid. Russell that's Westbrook that's a, good, that's a good one. Um, but but I, I, Pete Carroll's different than Matt Rule, I think, too. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think that's an interesting one. I, I think Teddy, and I think Teddy Bridgewater will succeed there um, as well. I think I think they're a team to watch. Definitely improvement over last year uh, uh, there as well. Uh, New Orleans, I mean, my goodness, you got Drew Brees back. They bring Malcolm Jenkins back uh, after a couple years in Philly. Emmanuel Sanders added to the wide receiver crew. They're going to be dangerous as always. And then Tampa, it really comes down to um, uh, to, to Tom Brady. People are you know, are kidding themselves. They're saying, well, can he learn a new system? He doesn't have to learn a new system. He's Tom Brady. They're going to play Tom Brady's system and do whatever he wants to do. And he's got the wide receiver talent and tight in talent he can throw the ball wherever he wants and it's the best talent he's probably ever played and of all the coaches to go to arians is a great guy just to be (laughs) to just like kind of roll with the flow with brady how different is arians from bill belichick oh it's incredible it's gonna be interesting to see tom brady in a different uniform and uh and and he should finish out his career there in Tampa. I think one of the receivers had number 12. Yeah, uh, Godwin, Chris Godwin. Yeah. Uh, I didn't even charge him for it. Smart, oh, I smart said, kid. I would have said, yeah, you can wear this number, but you better get your checkbook out first, too. Yeah, yeah. I made sure I got some money out of that one. Well, Chris Godwin's a receiver, and he's smart to I, do whatever he can to get under line, Tom Brady's. <laughs> bottom line, baby, I need some cash. You're going to get my number. That's all I got to say. I'll tell you, he's going to get paid when Tom Brady throws him 12 touchdowns in a season. Well, he, he can also <laughs> roll his ankle the first play of the first game <laughs> not have anything, so yep. yeah, get cut the next day. But yeah, let's see. I, I, I'm a, a geek when it comes to this stuff. Tom Brady talking about you know trying to roll it off like oh, 12 not a big deal for me. It's whatever oh. and. College. He's, he's company's and, named TB12. Yeah, yeah. He's Whatever. like, college, I had number 10, but they had a number 10 on the team, too. Godwin, Whatever. I think, is smart. He goes to number 14. Brady takes number 12. And here we go with the Tom Brady era in Tampa. All right, let's close it out with the NFC West. We've got the Arizona Cardinals, the Los Angeles Rams, San Francisco 49ers, and the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, a lot of turnover in L.A. this year, um, and uh, they even brought in new coaching staff, offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator. 49ers stay pretty pretty uh, right on where they were last season. Seattle makes a couple of additions, very few losses. And then Arizona had the, the biggest gain of the offseason with DeAndre Hopkins. What do you think about this division? Obviously, it's San Francisco and everybody else, but I don't think the margin is – as large as a lot of people think because of San Francisco's Super Bowl appearance last year. The Rams are a good go-against team, if you ask me. I, You lose Gurley. You've lost a lot of people due to salary cap. You've got Jared Goff still there, and he's horribly overpaid. They, I don't know why they gave him so much money. You're looking at a team in salary, salary cap uh, hell, excuse for the lack of a better term, in bad times with the salary cap for the next – couple of years so i'm going under eight and a half on the rams is one of my best plays for the season i think you're looking at two super bowl or two playoff teams here niners and seahawks and i'll give you a little prop right here vince stover if i said for the mvp award i'll give you patrick mahomes lamar jackson and russell wilson if i gave you those three and i took everybody else who whose side would you want to have i think i take Mahomes at this point you want Mahomes, lamar and russell Russell Wilson. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't think Russell Wilson's going to be MVP next year. Okay. Well, Las Vegas says that Mahomes is the first favorite, and then Lamar Jackson and Russell Wilson are tied for the second favorites. Everybody else is twenty to one or higher. So there's a definite threesome that are kind of in the race for the MVP, and then it's kind of like everybody else. So that's why I offered you those three. I would those take, three or the field is what you're asking. Yes. Oh, I take the field. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So of those three, yeah, I would say Russell Wilson is the least of the three. But Las Vegas has Russell Wilson and Lamar Jackson tied 
for the MVP six to one. So is it because Lamar Jackson, maybe they th- th- think he's going to fall off. Maybe Russell Wilson carries his team team <laughs> leader. I'm using air quotes as I say those things. Yeah. So yeah, those are the three players for the MVP. Niners and Seahawks playoff teams. Rams big play against this year. Arizona interesting because we don't really know how much will they improve over the last year. Right. Is Kyler Murray how much? What is he going to give you? You sit there and look at Arizona. They've got the number eight draft pick overall. Where are they going? They got their quarterback. They got a receiver in the off season. You'd think they're probably going to try to get alignment to protect Kyler Murray. Yeah. That Arizona is probably the question mark team this year because we don't know if they're going to improve or decline. But the Rams are the play against, and Niners and Seahawks are your playoff teams. Yeah, I think the Rams dropped to the fourth in the division this year. They lost too much talent. Dante Fowler, Corey Littleton, um, you know, Gurley, you can question whether or not that's how much of the loss that is. Uh, they've got good running back depth there in L.A. They lost just defensive players, though. They really didn't bring anybody else in. They have no money. They have very few draft picks. There's not a whole lot of hope in L.A. right now for the Rams. Cardinals are probably the most exciting team right now um, with because of their offense. Uh, they've got good receiving core now. Uh, running back is okay. Uh, it'll be to see how they improve. Uh, Cliff Kingsbury, if his second season is drastically better or not. Um, and then San Francisco, I think the biggest question San Francisco is quarterback also. Um, Garoppolo is a guy that, you know, people are saying, oh, San Francisco is offering Garoppolo for Brady. Well, I don't know if that would have been a great move or not. I think Garoppolo is a quarterback that's, that's not going to kill you, and he's a good guy to have around if you have enough talent around him. But the question is, is, do they? I mean, the running backs are fine. The receivers are okay, but they've got to get better in that spot. Obviously, they've got a great tight end as well and a very good defense. But they couldn't knew they couldn't pay everybody, so that's why DeForest Buckner is gone. They pick up the number 13 pick in the draft because of this. Might be a great spot to grab uh, C.D. Lamb or Jerry Judy right there at number 13, uh, and that will really boost their offense as well. Uh, outside of that, they lost Emmanuel Sanders, who they picked up midseason in a trade uh, as well. Uh, they're obviously the best team in the division. The Seahawks, uh, to me, the Seahawks are going the wrong direction. Uh, they did bring Bruce Irvin in. Greg Olson tied in. You know, it's they've got like 27 tight ends on the roster right now, and they've got some guys who've had some success in the NFL there, but uh, he's old and still good for his age, especially. Uh, outside of that, they really didn't bring anybody else in. Uh, so that, to me, it's a boring division to a degree. Uh, I think San Francisco is a really boring team to watch. They have a great defense. Uh, but I think Arizona's fun to watch, but you know they're not a great team at this point. At least we don't expect them to be. Hopkins is the wide receiver there in Arizona. Um, again, as a fantasy football player who has Hopkins in a keeper league, I'm scared to death because in, in Houston, they didn't throw to anybody else. He was catching 10 catches a game at least. And uh, now, you know, how much is he going to get the ball? I don't know. Um, but there's an interesting team there. I think the Rams are a team, or excuse me, the Cardinals are a team that this draft could help out a lot uh, as well. And they can go out and get somebody uh, that can make a difference for them. They have to improve their offensive line uh, also. But uh, interesting teams for sure. All right, so who's the one team in the NFL that you think that one draft pick can make the biggest difference for them? This year or long term? Uh, This season. Uh, It's Chase Young. I think if he goes to Washington, you might see them win a few games on the defensive side of the ball because, you know, he can play that outside linebacker defensive end Cause a little havoc there. I don't see these quarterbacks changing anything early, especially Burrow and Cincinnati. So a, Tua could go anywhere, but is he going to change the world immediately? Like Dan Marino, 1984? Probably not. So, yeah, it's Chase Young early. And uh, whoever gets Swift from Georgia, the running back, those are the kind of picks, you know, you, you put him on a good team. He's not going to go mid, early first round, but he's going to go to a decent team mid, later first round, unless the Dolphins get him. And... You know, if he gets in the right spot, right time, you know, he can put up seven, eight, nine hundred yards and do something for a playoff team. Yeah, I think that running back's an interesting position. I think if Kansas City gets the right guy at 32, I mean, you're saying, well, how can you improve on Super Bowl? But if their running game improves, that's going to help Mahomes. It's going to help their receiving core. It's going to help everything else as well. I think if they get Swift or possibly Jonathan Taylor, I don't know if they're interested in them or not, but if they did, I think that immediately uh, bolsters them again to another Super Bowl or at least most likely to another and Super Bowl. you look at Kansas City when Kareem Hunt was there. He was the best player in fantasy football. Yep. He gets himself in trouble. Is out of football. They put in all kinds of other people running back. They don't miss a beat, and they go on to win the Super Bowl. Yeah. So it's a lot, like you said, system sometimes trumps individual talent. 
Yeah. Uh, out of these guys at the top of the drafts, you're talking about the quarterbacks. Um, and then you've got Chase Young, Akuda, uh, Isaiah Simmons, the linebackers being talked about up there as well. A lot of offensive linemen. Do you see any of these guys being a, a, a bust that turns into one of the worst draft picks of all time? Tua. Tua really? has Tua has the the potential to be a bust. We don't know if he's healthy. Yeah. We don't know. You know, he, he broke his hip. Right. Bo Jackson broke his hip too. <laughs> didn't it end up, didn't end up well for him. So, and these teams haven't been able to really put Tua through these physicals to see if he is healthy. You know, who's putting on out this information? Tua's people is putting right. out the information. Oh, he's he's up and running around like it's nothing. Oh, watch this video. Well, that's that's his people doing that. Yeah. He can't go and take these physicals in these places. Yeah. The the jury is way out on Tua. Yeah. If you take him, you better be sure he's healthy because if he's not, you're going to get egg on your face, especially. If you're drafting three, four, five, six in the draft and you trade up to get him, and that's the kind of thing that gets general managers fired very quickly. I heard someone say this weekend, I don't remember who it is to give him credit, but they said, I want to know what happens when the video cuts off. Does he then heap over in pain? Oh. or you know, Because he's, he's look, he looks good in the videos. He's moving around really well. Uh, throwing the ball is not the concern. When was that video taken? We don't, uh, it could have been last year. Yeah. We don't know about this. You know. <laughs> so I know he's been working out with Trent Dilfer down in Nashville, and, no, and that supposedly means he's it's terrible. a great thing. But. That means he's going to throw a lot of interceptions <laughs> and be highly overrated, yes. What, what qualifies someone as a bust? A bust? Depending on – I look at a lot of things, and I numerically – have a nice little system that I've come up with. Okay. From our good friends at ProFootballReference.com. We take the position where they were drafted overall, one, two, three, four, and then we look at their career value in ter- from Pro Football Reference, and that's zero, one, two, all the way up to hundreds or however good the player is. And so I put a little list together. All right. I put a list together. The worst five first-round draft picks in the history of the NFL. Now, I'll tell you right now, three of them are quarterbacks. Okay. And I, I'll let you guess at t- the, the quarterbacks because I don't think you've heard of the other two guys. Well, the one is is Akili Smith from yes, Cincinnati. Yes, he is number four on the list. He was drafted third overall, had a career record of 3-14, and 14, five touchdowns, 13 interceptions. His career value was three, so he gets three points in our little system. It's like golf. The worse, the <laughs> lower the score, the better the, better the pick was. So, yeah, he's number four on my list. I'll All give right. you another chance to pick another quarterback. In my lifetime, it seems like Ryan Leaf would fall into Ryan that. Ryan Leaf is number three. He's easily the worst quarterback. Taking second overall, 4-17 and 17 record. Here's the number, though. 14 career touchdowns, 36 interceptions. Wow. He had the worst game I ever I ever saw in my life. We played at <laughs> Kansas City. And I think he – I I don't have it written down. He had no touchdowns, and he had three interceptions and a lost fumble. Oh, my god! And goodness. it was just awful. He went one for 15. I do remember that. One for 15, three picks, and a lost fumble. The worst game I've ever <laughs> seen a quarterback in my life. Now, there's one more quarterback on our list, and then we'll get to our two unknowns. The other quarterback – boy, I'm trying to think through. A hint. He was taken first overall this century. This century? This century. Oh, then I should know this. You should know this. Another hint. The location of that team has recently changed cities. All right. Oh, Jamarcus Russell. Jamarcus yeah. Russell. First overall pick. Career record 7-18. and 18. I didn't know he picked, he started 25 games. That's surprising. I didn't know he started that many. <laughs> 18 picks, 23 interceptions. Overall value 6, but the fact that he went first overall – Means his score is six points in our little bit. He's fifth. So three is Ryan Lee, four is Akili Smith, five is Jamarcus Russell. Now, I will give you the other two because the other two you you wouldn't get, <laughs> I wouldn't get, even draft Knicks would get. There's a defensive tackle named Ted Gregory who got picked by the Denver Broncos in 1987. He's played in three career games. He was picked, uh, excuse me, he was picked 26th overall, but he played in three games in his life. Had one sack. He was traded after in midseason that year. Never played for the Saints after that. He played three career games, first round draft pick, had one sack. Wow. The number one in our little system, worst overall pick, and this is a guy you've never heard of. He was picked in 1985 by the St. Louis Cardinals. His name is Clyde Duncan. He played at Tennessee back in the early 80s. Wow. So, yes, look up your Clyde Duncan uh, trivia. <laughs> career at Tennessee he had 27 receptions so how he went in the first round I don't know this was the St. Louis Cardinals of the 80s 
He played, he in his career, he went 17th overall to the Cardinals. Four receptions for 39 yards in his career. 17th overall pick. Wow. You got four receptions out of him. The According to my numbers, the average his career value was zero. So in Clyde Duncan, the worst overall draft pick in the history of the NFL because his value was zero. Zero had, value. And these are guys that didn't go out because of injury. Correct. They just stunk. <laughs> wow. <laughs> they were just terrible. And by the second year, the Cardinals in the middle of the season said, uh, we don't need you anymore. <laughs> and before long, there's no salary cap, so it was like you know we can cut you yeah. anytime we want. You're just terrible, sir. You're you're never going to live up to your first round things. Just go take a hike, and he did. So there you go, there you go. There's your top <laughs> five. We had three quarterbacks that you've probably heard of. Honorable mention: Charles Rogers, a receiver for Detroit. Yeah, he was drafted. Michigan in, State. Yes. Yeah. He was drafted in uh, 2003, third overall. And he had 36 receptions. Wow. And he had, he was, yeah. <laughs> that was during the Matt Millen receiving days. When yes. He, he picked three receivers in a row. Calvin Johnson was the good one. Mm-hmm. Mike Williams, USC, bust. Yep. Charles Rogers, uh, Michigan State, bust. The fact that he still, in that fourth year, the third year, took Calvin Johnson second after already drafting two busts early, the two, previous two seasons, that was gutsy enough as it was. That was pre-Paul Johnson. That was Chan okay. Gailey and the infamous Reggie Ball was your quarterback. <laughs> if you can remember that far back, you Georgia, you fellow Atlantans out there, remember how miserable Reggie Ball was as a quarterback for Georgia Tech. So yes, Calvin Johnson was the the. It was a gutsy play by Matt Millen to take Calvin Johnson after already blowing two first rounders on two terrible receivers. So, but there you have it, Clyde Duncan for the University of Tennessee. Go look it up when you get home, kids. He was your number one all-time NFL draft bust in the first round, going 17th overall and having four career catches, and that's it. My goodness. Well, there you go. Draft bust, and he says, bottom line says, watch out for Tua. Could be a biggest draft bust. And I understand that. You're talking about you don't know how healthy he is, and, and if he goes to the wrong team, he could be ruined in a heartbeat. You just never know what's going to happen. You look at guys like uh, David Carr. If he was in a better situation, then maybe he wouldn't have been a bust. So, so much, especially quarterbacks, so much of it has to do with the system and the situation that you're put in as a young quarterback. And to succeed as a young quarterback, you think about it, there's 32 jobs in the world for this. And, and in most years, we've got 18 of them that are decent. And so it's hard to believe you can't find 32 guys, but it's not the, the player. The player has the talent um, to a degree. It is the system. It is the situation they're in. David Carr got sacked millions of times. And, I mean, you just can't recover from that kind of stuff many times over. So, interesting stuff here on the NFL draft. It's not like Major League Baseball and the NBA, where if you're good, it's going to show. Right. If Tom Brady gets drafted by the Cleveland Browns, right. he's not he, he's been out of football for 15 years. Right. You know, he's selling insurance every day. Yeah, you so, if you put Tom Brady with Bill Belichick on the Cleveland Browns, it still turns out bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's that's the amazing thing about the NFL. It is so much right place, right time, right situation, situation right coach, right everything. Yeah, and there's guys out there. Uh, we already talked about the free agents and Winston and Cam Newton. You got Dalton who could be traded. You've got other guys like Josh Rosen who who don't seem to have had a real opportunity yet in a decent situation. Oh, but he's terrible though. And uh, very Rosen, well may be. Could Joe Montana have played for the Packers back in the '80s when the Packers were terrible, and they're mm-hmm. playing in the cold with the wind, and Joe Montana's <laughs> just throwing those little two yard dinks? Could he have played? Could he have thrown that bomb to James Lofton back in the day? I don't know. Right. We, you know. Right. Because. Would he have even gotten that chance? He probably would. He was, you know, Lynn Dickey would have played over Joe Montana back then. (laughs) Opportunity is everything. Opportunity is everything. And that's not just a football lesson, folks. That's a life lesson for you as well. Well, we've had a great time talking about the draft. It's been good to have the host. I have. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> well, fine then. Uh, it's been good to have the host of the Bottom Line Lexington. I've always appreciated the opportunities to come on, 
talk sports with him. And in a time like this, when there is some sports to talk about, we want to talk about it. And uh, and so, first of all, thank you, Bottom Line, for joining us today for the podcast and for sharing some knowledge that's very different. We're not going to do two hours on baseball? What, are you, what are we waiting for? Let's go. <laughs> Brewers! Over 84 and a half wins. What? No? Okay. Coming up next, China Basketball Association. Uh, no. Russian chess. <laughs> Russian chess. chess. Russian chess. Oh, boy. <laughs> that is, uh, you can literally, in offshore and faraway places, you can invest on that. That is true. <laughs> Russian chess. It's all rigged. Don't don't rush. Don't bet on Russian chess. Yeah, uh, I saw NBA 2K on ESPN the other night. Oh they're my playing, goodness! They're, if they had Tecmo Bowl back in the day, I would have been a professional. They're I doing it with Madden. They're doing it with with NBA 2K. They're it's just crazy, crazy times we're living. In. I'm so thankful. Let's talk about this briefly. Um, the NFL draft. The commissioner come under attack by saying he shouldn't hold hold it here in April. He should push it back. And all the teams are complaining because they have to do it through technology and can't be in the big meeting rooms and everything like that. Let me get your opinion on it, then I'll share my opinion. Should the draft be a uh, regular time, regular place? I don't know why not. If you could do it by internet and Zoom and telephone and whatever, I it just it's this year more than ever right you'll be able to see who knows what they're doing yes and, uh, heck just follow mel kuyper or something I mean, <laughs> just get the, we need something right now yes to focus our attentions and our gambling on so we need something to focus on have the draft via the internet let people tune in on television and watch it and just give us something anything right now because lord the good lord knows we're going through some tough times down here let us have the NFL draft so we can just have something to focus on. That's great points. The, 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 I didn't understand the kickback. I didn't understand why people were so upset they were still going to do it. Why not do it? Just like you said, everybody could do it. Sean Payton, they already got their room set up in a local brewery down in New Orleans. I don't understand why they can't go to their own building and do it. But nonetheless, keep your, your social distancing and, and all those kinds of things and follow the CDC guidelines. Wash your hands. Um, but a telephone and internet can do the draft. That's how it's done anyhow. Just there's other people in the building. How do you draft fantasy teams? Right. Yeah. 99% <laughs> of us draft our fantasy football teams on the internet. On the internet. If we can draft our teams on the internet, and Lord knows it's more important, our fantasy team is more important than the NFL draft. We all know that. So if you can do that over the internet, you can do the NFL draft over the internet. Great opportunity for the NFL and ESPN. Show the screen like a fantasy football page. Do the draft that way. Have them select players. What an opportunity to push for fantasy football. Uh, not that it needs a whole lot of push right now. Uh, but we don't have many sports, and the draft is is right here. It's right around the corner. I'm looking forward to it. I'm thankful for it. I'm glad we have something uh, uh, as a sports fan to invest into, to watch, to uh, enjoy uh, over a three-day period. Um, it's going to be great. I'm excited about it uh, nonetheless. But, again, uh, thank you, Bottom Line, for being with us today. Um, <laughs> Congratulations for being the first the first guest on the Sports Stove podcast. I know you were Hopefully I'm not honored. the last. <laughs> I know I know it's a great honor uh, for you to be here. But uh, nonetheless, thank you for being on with us. Thank you for sharing uh, uh, your side of things uh, when it comes to the NFL and the draft coming up. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Vince Stover, you are a good man, and I admire you very much and what you do every single day, and, and I'm grateful to uh, call you my friend. So I do this anytime. As the lights literally come on, as I <laughs> and we've been sitting here for two hours, and the lights have been out. This one light has been out, and as soon as I call Vince Stover, my friend, the light oh. comes on. If that's not a gift from God or a sign from God, I don't there know what is. is, ladies and gentlemen. Back to you, Vince Stover. Uh, thank you for tuning in today. You can always catch us on social media: Twitter at Sports Stove and Facebook, the Sports Stove Podcast. Uh, we're just getting started on YouTube. As we get more material up, we'll talk more about that. Uh, bottom line: Where can they follow you? Catch you at? You can follow me on Twitter at Bottom Line Lex and other places if you pay attention and on <laughs> at Bottom Line Lex. But for the time being, I am not at privy. I'm not privy to reveal those places. Uh, for fear of, you know, a couple of months from now. <laughs> Back to you. Bottom Line Lexington Podcast, you can find it on Apple iTunes. You That's can find true, it on, yes. Bottom uh, Line Lexington Podcast. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I was I thought the light was about to go out of me again. <laughs> Bottom Line Lexington Podcast, at Bottom Line Lex on Twitter. Thank you so much for, for listening, and thank you so much for having me on the show.
Yeah. Just over. Uh, it's a good podcast to listen to, especially as sports get kicked up again. I was really excited about March Madness on Bottom Line Lexington and, and didn't get the opportunity Oh, I was this too, year. but I'm not allowed to talk about that <laughs> for reasons we can't get into right now. But uh, you can subscribe uh, to the Bottom Line Lexington podcast and take a listen uh, and catch up on some old episodes that are there. You'll find the sports stove on there a number of times, especially here in the most recent season of the Bottom Line Lexington podcast. Thank you for joining with us today hope you enjoyed the nfl draft talk feel free to comment and share any of your opinions whether you agree or disagree with any of these thoughts that have been given today and uh hey let's go football uh until next time we'll see you around the sports stove